My name is Hassan Hakimian. I'm director of the London Middle East Institute, uh, a, one of the sponsors of the wonderful exhibition uh, uh, upstairs that I will tell you a little bit uh, about in a moment, and also the host to tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, let me start by thanking you all for uh, your interest and turning up on uh, a fairly cold January night, but I'm sure uh, this lecture would be anything but cold. And by the end of it, the uh, intellectual temperature will rise, uh, making it a very worthwhile uh, gathering. It's uh, an honor and pleasure to host Princess Vejdan uh, Al Hashimi uh, back to SOAS. She's a very known uh, intellectual, academic, art historian, and diplomat. Uh, I will do a proper introduction in a moment. Uh, but uh, let me just say very briefly about the uh, exhibition at the Brunei Gallery, which maybe some of you have already had the chance to see. This, uh, exhibition of traditional embroidered textiles from the lands of the Indus, Afghanistan, the Near East, and Central Asia was uh, curated by Mrs. Marianne Bukhari. Where are you sitting, Marianne? Well, I think you should stand up so everybody sees you. Marianne has put in a tremendous amount of effort uh, to make sure that uh, this exhibition happens. It's not the first exhibition she has held at the Brunei Gallery, uh, but this is, of course, uh, the latest. And um, it opened uh, last week on Friday, to be precise, and it will be open for another couple of months. So those of you who haven't seen it, I hope you will have an opportunity to see with this exhibition, which is an extraordinary collection of traditionally embroidered textiles along the Silk Road, and that covers an enormous geographical expanse, as we know. They are hand-woven articles. Uh, they record the colors of natural dyes, stitches, patterns, motifs, and the trade of woven cotton, wool, and silk along this ancient trade route. And of course, they embody uh, history, culture, and the story of uh, women who have woven these. So there are several layers of uh, narratives and stories behind the objects that are, by the way, uh, full of absolutely brilliant and vibrant colors. If you haven't seen, uh, a feast of colors is expecting you at the gallery. Um, it brings together several collections to display the high level of abstraction and sophistication with which these pieces were made. And Marianne uh, narrates a story of the communities uh, that em em embroidered, who embroidered a people's history of the Silk Road. Uh, accompanying the exhibition, uh, we are very pleased to have a series of eight lectures. I'm sure you've seen the program. And uh, this is uh, the inaugural lecture, a very special lecture that kicks off the series tonight. So let me now turn to our eminent speaker, Her Royal Highness Princess Vijdan Bent Awaz Al Hashimi. She's known to many of you here, and as the cliche introduction says, knows no introduction, but let me at least try a little bit. Princess Vijdan is an accomplished and internationally renowned uh, art historian academic and diplomat. She earned her PhD in SOAS in Islamic art and archeology span in 1993, I'm very pleased to say. As you know, this is the SOAS centenary, so it's a very special year for us and every opportunity to welcome back our uh, eminent uh, alumni is a great pleasure for us. In 2010, SOAS uh, offered Princess Vijdan an honorary fellowship. For many years, she has been an ambassador for Islamic art in Jordan and throughout the Arab world. Princess Vijdan shares with SOAS a commitment to the study, preservation, and exhibition of Islamic art. An art historian and curator herself, she established 
Jordan's Royal Society of Fine Arts in 1979, which in turn led to the foundation of the Jordan uh, National Gallery of Fine Arts. In 2001, she founded and became Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Design at the University of Jordan. She is the curator of numerous exhibitions inside and outside Jordan. Princess Vejdan has written nine books on traditional and contemporary Islamic art in Arabic and in English, and has contributed to or edited several others. She has been a visiting professor at several universities in Europe, in the United States, and the Middle East, and has published numerous papers in academic journals. As I mentioned before, she is herself an artist with work in museums, including the British Museum here in London, and Ashmolean Museum, the National Museum of Women in the Arts in the USA, and the National Gallery in Islamabad. Princess Vijdan is an accomplished diplomat. In 1962, she became the first woman to enter the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Jordan. Uh, she was also the first woman delegate to represent Jordan at the United Nations meetings and the General Assembly. For five years, between 2006 and 2011, she was her country's um, ambassador to Italy. She was the first to write the history of modern and contemporary Islamic art and has over 19 publications that I mentioned. At present, she continues painting, working in glass and writing. It's such a special pleasure to have you with us, Princess Vijdan, and uh, especially to inaugurate the series lecture in honor of the uh, exhibition at the Brunei Gallery. She will speak for about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity, give or take, give or take a uh, little bit, a few minutes. I'm going to, with your permission, actually uh, join the audience because I want to uh, listen and learn. This is not my subject area. Those of you who know me, you know I'm an economist. Here in SWAS, we are privileged. Uh, we interact with other disciplines freely at will, and that's one of the best things that can happen in a university environment. So I want to learn. I'll be sitting there and watching and listening. And without further ado, let me uh, welcome Princess Vejdan to the podium. And please join me in showing appreciation for her. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassanian. Thank, I thank SOAS. And I thank the doctor for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to talk. I love to talk like all teachers. And uh, I hope I will be able to answer some of the questions after I saw the uh, exhibition and the collection. It's a stupendous collection. And I really recommend everybody to go and see it at one point. I'm coming back tomorrow or the day after to see it uh, quietly. Since the dawn of his life on earth, man has been coming up with various artistic expressions. It is the outcome of a natural instinct to want to add beauty to life through creativity. Such an impulse has inspired humans throughout history to express themselves by different means, of which embroidery is but one. The main advantages of this craft or art is its flexibility and mobility that even nomads can practice it while changing their settlement and moving from one lo locale to another. <coughs> among, the oldest, um, among the oldest embroidered pieces in the world is the collection of embroideries found in Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt. He reigned from about 1,333 to 1,323, very short period, um, uh, BCE in Egypt, which make up a firm base to the study of Middle Eastern embroidery. So far, no evidence has survived from the first millennium, uh, despite a very small number of embroidered textiles that um, has been recorded from first millennium uh, see sites of uh, Mas'ada and Qumran in Palestine. Among the objects of ritual and household use, <coughs> um, 
among the uh, and, uh, discovered at the site were a number of textiles, mostly made of linen or wool, while the decoration was woven into the cloth using various weave types, as you can see around the piece. Um, only one small object had a simple form of embroidery, this one. In the Levant, the oldest embroidered pieces found are the ones discovered in Lebanon, um, in Ansi al Hadath, located in Qadisha Valley. The discovery goes back to 1283, the Middle Ages, consists of eight bodies that uh, naturally became mummified due to the lack of oxygen, humidity, insects, and organic organism. One of the bodies belongs to a three to four months old female child wearing three layers of cloth. The outer garment is decorated with cross stitch embroidery in brown and red thread. Cross stitch is the oldest form of embroidery and can be found all over the world, especially in Asia, Eastern Europe, as well as continental Europe. What is remarkable here is not only the embroidered cross stitch in red silk floss on the outer garment, but the cut of the dress itself and the placing of the embroidery on the chest and sleeves, which is no different from today's Jordanian, Syrian, and Palestinian peasant dresses. Here is the, this is the um, uh, one found in Lebanon the child's dress, and here you see the peasant dresses um, in the three countries I, I just mentioned. The Byzantine Empire, it is the same, even the sleeves, if you did, not all the sleeves have those extensions, but even the sleeves, the cut of the dress itself, and the placing of the embroidery hasn't changed much since. <coughs> In the, um, what is remarkable here, as I said, the embroidered cross stitch, it is the cut. The Byzantine Empire, with its capital Constantinople, was predominantly Greek speaking. Its existence lasted a thousand years or so and controlled much of Asia Minor, East and Southeastern Europe, and the Eastern Mediterranean, the Levant, comprising um, external and internal groups, including the Arabs, Persians, and Turks, among others. Throughout its history, Constantinople was known for its lavishness, extravagance, and richness, using its church and secular embroidery in gold, silver, and precious and semi-precious stones and pearls worked on a silk ground. When the Ottomans came to power after the Byzantines, they continued the production of embroidered textiles that became a feature throughout the Mediterranean. One of the most effective impacts on the embroidery in the Arab world is that of Ottoman techniques and designs. From the late 15th to the late 19th centuries, Istanbul was the political and cultural center for much of the Arab world. Its dress traditions spread across the empire, influencing many of the local clothing traditions. This is embroidery, um, Turkish embroidery with gold thread, <coughs> and this as well. And the, um, uh, the uh, motifs are very um, Ottoman. What came from, uh, down to Syria, Jordan, and Palestine was mainly metal thread embroidery with colored silk floss. For example, new gold and silver metallic thread, qasab, was produced in Aleppo and Homs in, the, in Syria for, for Bethlehem uh, embroidered dresses. Later, it was imported from France and later from Japan. Now either Korea or Japan they get it because it's much cheaper. The influence of metallic thread reached Bedouin clothes and we see it among the tribes of Jordan. 
By the end of the 19th century, this form of embroidery could be found throughout the Ottoman Empire, especially in the civilian and military uniforms worn by high um, officials. Embroidery has been an artistic expression throughout the Arab world, including Jordan, Syria, and Palestine. Uh, since early medieval period, it was normal for respectable women, especially uh, widows, to teach young ladies at home embroidery as a form of art that could be useful for the household or for the dowry of daughters and other female relations. Uh, the quality achieved in those pieces mirrored the girl's family and social status, patience, obedience, and in general, her potential for making a good um, marriage. The production of embroidery at home was socially important. It provided supervised entertainment and an escape from a domestic situation in a society where girls were hardly allowed to leave the family home, nor were they very much uh, involved in household duties because of the large number of servants. The patterns that were developed carried certain meanings and signs. They were like stamps that indicated a certain area where from the wearer came, be it a town or a village, a family, a tribe, social and marital status of the wearer, religion, etc. Those patterns were characteristics that explained the identity of the woman wearing the garment. Meanwhile, the teachers of embroidery were mostly widows or ladies from poor families who needed the extra income. At the same time, similar set of conditions was also present in Europe with regard to the teaching of embroidery to society young ladies, especially in France and Italy, I suppose. From the mid 19th century onwards, many girls learned Western style embroidery in machinery and convent schools. Later, local schools took up this art and taught it instead of lessons in drawing and painting. The reason being um, uh, behind this was that the absence of or lack of trained art teachers who were almost non-existent until later in the second half of the 20th century. Even then, only private schools were able to um, employ artists to teach art. I remember I went to a, a nun's school, Sisters of Nazareth in, in Amman, and we used to take embroidery instead of art lessons, so, and I hated it, to do it. So I used to take it home, give it to my mother, and she would uh, embroider those silly little um, table covers, uh, or cushions, and I will take the first prize in school. <laughs> the Jordan, Palestine, um, in Jordan, Palestine, and Syria, the indigenous traditional society is divided into three stratums. Nomadic Bedouins living in the desert and on its fringe, settled peasants living in a village, and the countryside and urban city dwellers, including the higher echelon of society, the aristocracy. Each of these had its own customs according to its way of life, environment, and needs. By looking at an Arab woman from the Levant wearing traditional dress, one could tell the region, the village, and area where the lady came from, and in some cases, which tribe she belonged to, her social standing, her financial status, even her religion. Two ideas are often reflected in the ornamentation of women's dresses. They are protection against the evil eye and fertility. The choice of color and design is also affected by what is locally regarded as suitable for different ages and the marital status of the wearer. Baby's clothes, for example, should carry a protection against the evil eye in all its forms. The clothes for girls or of marriageable age are usually different from those of a married woman or a widow. The color of the embroidery can define the status of the wearer. A married woman would wear a dress with a lot of red and blue embroidery to indicate her sexual maturity and marital status. 
Meanwhile, a widow's dress should have a minimum of embroidery in either blue or blue with a little red. Levantine embroidery patterns are divided into two kinds, figurative and geometric designs. Figurative patterns include human beings, animals, plants, trees, and various other objects, such as combs or the moon. Meanwhile, geometric designs range from the very simple built around bands of horizontal S shapes, known as leeches or snakes, to complex, intricate back patterns that require a sophisticated understanding of mathematics in order to understand how they are composed. In the exhibition today upstairs, I saw the um, uh, geometric patterns uh, there, and they really need to, ha to be analyzed uh, very carefully. You would think an, a genius in mathematics had uh, created those uh, figures. Men's clothes um, are less elaborate and carried less decorative elements because virility for an Arab male is translated into less is more. In general, a man is not given to frivolous colors and embroidery or to patterns that will reveal his identity to strangers. This robe, this uh, garment is from Syria. In Jordan, they are very um, Calvinist in their clothes. They are very just white, uh, long uh, floor length shirts. That's all uh, you can see, they can wear. Traditional Arabs men's costumes are quite similar throughout the Levant. The basic attire consists of a long shirt, gumbaz, this, while amongst Bedouins, it is a colorless long shirt that reaches the ankles, thobe, baggy long shorts or trousers, sirwal, a belt, hizam, a cloak, abaya, that is the best gorge of a man's wealth, and a head cover. Mama lefa hatta or kafiya, folded into a triangle and held in place on the head with a circular cord called agal. In the winter, the Bedouin wears a farwa, which is a full length cloak lined with a lamp's fleece. Jordan enjoys a unique geographic position as part of Greater Syria, along millennia old routes that connected Mesopotamia with the Mediterranean and Turkey and Syria proper with the Arabian Peninsula and Egypt. It was a principal staging post along the pilgrim uh, routes that each year brought Muslims from all over the Islamic world to the holy city of Mecca. Equally for centuries, Orthodox Christian pilgrims from a wide range of countries, including Egypt, Greece, Syria, and greater Russia, came to bathe in the River Jordan. Meanwhile, in the 19th century, Christian missionary groups came from Europe and North America to baptize members of their communities in the River Jordan, bringing with them their own forms of clothing and decorative techniques, including embroidery. Some stayed on in Jordan and Palestine, hence embroidery from both countries shows the constant mixture of local and foreign impacts. Unlike that of its neighbors, Jordanian embroidery took second place to the elaborate and attractive woven textiles uh, traditionally produced by Jordanian Bedouins. They include kilims, tent furnishings, saddlebags, and uh, clothing, such as men's abayas and short jackets for both sexes. Here, these are saddlebags and hangings, uh, tent hangings, and uh, kilims. See the, you see the complicated um, uh, designs they, they carry. This is the abaya, the very uh, rough wool uh, uh, coat for men and women as well. Here are women uh, working uh, on their knolls. And this is for the camels and horses. <coughs> okay. 
An, uh, an example of Jordanian embroidered dresses comes mostly from Karak and Salts. Th these are some patterns that, um, Jordanian patterns embroidered on uh, the clothes. Here mostly geometric, uh, but with cross stitch, whatever you do, even the very natural ones, they look geometric uh, somehow. This is a very interesting dress. It's called Thob Ob. Uh, it is twice. It's worn in Karaks and Salts and the Jordan Valley in Ghor, where there are two types of dresses, the ankle short length and the extra long dress, Thob Ob. The short dresses are embroidered around the neck opening, sleeve, cuffs, and hem. The long dresses are the same, but without the decoration on the cuffs. Both dresses are typified by the use of cross stitch. stitch. Um, such typical designs from the second half of the 20th century show stylized flowers, mostly roses and geometric patterns. Actually, the thob uh, is a unique dress within the Arab world. It is nearly twice the height of most women who wear this style and dress. It was made to, uh, in, uh, of light blue cotton material, but by the 1920s, those dresses were more often made of black cotton, dubet, black satin, malas, or a black crepe, Abu Safarti. And they came in two basic forms, one for daily use, either in plain or with minimal decoration, a second one embroidered for festivals and special occasions. One of the stories associated with the dress is that during Ottoman rule, as women were seldom or rather never searched by men, they wore thob ob in order to hide small items of value, such as money and jewelry, from the local tax collectors. Hence, the folds of the dress would supply ample capacity for concealment. On a more practical level, the large folding of the dress had a functional value as the air was trapped between the folds of cloth that was cooler than the surrounding air. It is also possible that this dress had more to do with pretension than comfort as the large folding and prolonged sleeves were a visible demonstration of how much material had been used. However, by the beginning of the 21st century, Thob Ob was no longer worn by nomadic women from the Ghor, Rift Valley, the cities of Salt and Karak. On daily basis, probably because of its high cost and unpractical usage. The tribal system still exists in Jordan. Every Jordanian of East Bank origin and many of the Palestinian or of Palestinian origin who are technically Arab are as opposed to Circassians and either Muslim or Orthodox Christians belong to a tribe. Among the Bedouin hierarchy, there are several tribes who fall at the top of the desert so social pyramid, such as the Adwan, uh, Bani Sakhar, Bani Hassan, and the Abbajis, among others. These are the desert aristocracy, hence the ladies' clothes are richly embroidered in colored silk thread on black silk fabric, cut thob ob, and their jewelry made of uh, agat or rich Ottoman metal and, or, um, coral as well as silver and gold. The influence of rich Ottoman metal embroidery is apparent on the um, uh, ladies' jackets, meanwhile. There is no distinction in men's clothes as they are all similar. The abaya could have gold thread embroidery along the collar and down the front that gives its owner a distinctive touch. But here you can see the gold influence, the Ottoman uh, gold thread embroidery, how it has reached even uh, in places in the desert among um, Bedouin women. This is the abaya, the men's abaya. The collar is the only show of uh, affluence, if we can call it that, by having it large or uh, narrower than usual. 
In Syria, during the medieval period, it was, uh, Syria was fa famous for the production of tiraz. Tiraz textiles, I'm not going to go into, uh, I'm sure you know a bit about it, into details, but um, it has uh, an embroidered band that used to be put on the upper arm by men and, and women. And there are two theories. One theory that Tiraz was originated in early Byzantium, and when the Umayyads came, they took it up and, and continued the tradition. And um, another theory that it was in Persia, uh, originated in Persia, and then from Persia it went to Iraq, and um, the Abbasids spread it all over in Egypt, and Syria and Lebanon, all, all over the place. Now, this is a drawing where the tiraz would be put on the upper uh, side of the arm, of the uh, arm, yeah. Besides embroidery, other, uh, other small items are sewn to the Bedouin and peasant, and peasant uh, dress, such as spangles made of small length of wire flattened with a hammer, sequins that are similar to a spangle and made of glass plastic, recently plastic, and so forth. Small glass beads, paillettes made of glass, metal, plastic shells, coins, amulets, which are cherished for their amuletic values, chains, discs, colored glass beads, and coins which used to be uh, gold and silver, but in, uh, at present are often gold and silver colored discs. I'll show you. As with many parts of the Arab world, Syrian embroidery um, can be divided into three basic groups. The urban, associated with large cities, such as Damascus, Aleppo, Homs, Halab, the village embroidery linked with peasant communities, and the semi-nomadic Bedouin groups, because in Syria, like in Jordan, there, there are um, Bedouins who still wear their own costumes. Much of the Syrian metal thread embroidery, as well as machine embroidery, was executed by men in ateliers of variable sizes. During the 19th century, the embroidery associated with Damascus and other major uh, urban um, centers was heavily influenced by the Ottoman. Syria is the country mostly influenced by Turkish uh, culture among the three uh, countries. And here we see the Ottoman style with its gold metal thread and rich designs for both women and men's clothes, as well as objects such as covers, um, curtains, tablecloths, and um, bags, mirror bags, bath towers, and silk wraps of large silk squares decorated with elaborate gold and silver uh, thread embroidery, especially used by a bride in the hammam, in the bathhouse. 
By the beginning of the 20th century, more and more Syrian men and women switched to European styles that excluded the Ottoman forms of gold thread embroidery associated with Damascus and other urban centers, such as Aleppo and Hama. Hence, this type of embroidery on clothes diminished and only continued on household items today. By the second half of the um, 20th century ready dyed artificial silks of various qualities came from Europe and Asia as well as synthetic threads and acrylic yarn. Thus, non Western local crafts suffered drastically from competition with mass, with mass produced goods. Palestine, the earliest form of the uh, forms of Holy Land embroidered. Cross stitch can, can be traced to about 11th century AD to Saint Francis, who tended wounded Christian and Muslim soldiers in the Holy Land, as uh, is supposed to have brought a treasure of ancient religious symbols to Assisi, resulting in the Assisi embroidery of stylized uh, outline representing animals, birds, and geometric shapes dated from the 13th and 14th centuries and executed by nuns. 15th to 17th centuries witnessed the execution of elaborate biblical scenes, animals, plants, and mythological motifs. Embroidery was considered a church art uh, during the Italian uh, Renaissance. Cross stitch is the main stitch employed in Palestinian embroidery, which is the richest both in motif intensity and color among Levantine costumes. It has, this is Syria again, we're still in Syria with the colored uh, on, on black uh, silk. This is also Syria. You see the, the uh, Christian Syrians with the cross on top of the uh, tree. This is Palestinian, very rich embroidery, much different from the Jordanian uh, one, and even the Syrian. The cross stitch is the main stitch employed in Palestinian embroidery. There are others, but mainly uh, cross stitch, which is the richest both in motif intensity and color among Levantine costumes. It has its early origins in Chinese craftsmanship, that is the cross stitch, moving from there to India, then to Egypt, then to Greece or Rome, and then to the Levant. Traditional uh, Palestinian folk yeah. embroidery is an art passed down from one generation to the next. The major foreign influences on embroidery after the Byzantines and Ottomans, though less than in Syria, which has been discussed earlier, were the Germans, French, British, Italians, Americans, who wielded some influence through mission schools in the cities or through settlers presenting services to villagers. Some settled in self-styled colonies in towns around biblical sites while leaving their mark on the form of religious buildings, charitable organizations, and so on, while making their contribution to embroidery as well. The rural areas, in rural areas, the iconography usually mirrors local scenes. Hence, the embroiderers choose items from their da daily lives, such as palm trees, cypress, heads of corn, pigeons, combs, even snakes. The meaning of the message transmitted by the motif might vary from one region to another. Urban areas tend to have more general meanings as the embroidery is produced for a wider range of clientele. Um, private and public. Among the early foreign influences in Palestine were the hand embroidered, um, this is again a dress in Palestinian peasant dress, 
So is this, the photography is not very good here. You see, it is, it's really full of uh, figures. Among the early foreign influences in, Palis in Palestine were the hand embroidered Chinese silk shawls, very strange, known as Chinese shawls, Canton shawls, or Spanish shawls in the Hispanic world, Mantones de Manila, because they used to be shipped in the Manila galleons in the Philippines. They were hand embroidered silk shawls made in southern China and became fashionable from 1830s to the 40s, probably to provide an inexpensive substitute to cashmere shawls whose prices were increasing, or possibly as a sophisticated urban version of peasant shawls that were part of the folk costume in many regions. The entanglement of politics through the embroidery is an old trend in Palestinian fashion, but not that old. A Palestinian design named the Tents of the Pasha, Khiyam al Basha, is named after the Ottomans, while the officer's pip, Nishan al Dabat, probably goes back to the time of the British Mandate. Such designs as the, uh, are, uh, as the Barlev line and Sadat and Begin refer to the 1967 ceasefire line and the two leaders of Egypt and Israel. Although in 1948, the year of the first Arab-Israeli war, 40% of Palestinians lived in cities, yet the idealization of what peasants stood for, um, the attachment to the land, the essential, um, the essential to Palestinian existence, was well, essential to Palestinian existence was an intrinsic part de, uh, that, defi defi that defined their continued struggle to regain their country. Eventually, throughout the years of Israeli occupation, the national dress of a Palestinian woman came to signify a new role, that of a sacred mother who by bearing children, they will grow up to be fighters and liberate the land. Thus, she is performing a national duty and turning motherhood into a national obligation. So what do mothers wear? They transform their national costume into a patriotic weapon for which new symbols are created through embroidery. One of the most significant, this is the Chinese shawl, sorry, you can see the silk Chinese shorts that we just mentioned. This is a um, new uh, embroidered motifs. One of the most significant symbols is the Palestinian flag and its colors. The Dome of the Rock and the Aqsa Mosque are two important symbols as well as the pigeon carrying an olive branch and a gun. Hence, Palestinian national identity. Here, you see the, the map of Palestine and the uh, flag of Palestine on a peasant dress, which is not really a city dress, one can say. It is a change that reflects the dynamics of continued and tiring exile and the maturing of new generations in the, in the diaspora. In 1987, the first intifada began and women's role on the front line was important. The women of Qalandia camp and the villages of Hebron in the West Bank began to make intifada dresses. When the Israelis confiscated the Palestinian flags from the women protesting against uh, the occupation and forbade its artistic representation, the women began to embroider the traditional cypress tree motif in the colors of their flag. The silhouette of the map of Palestine in endless repetition as well as a white dove in flight with a rifle between its claws. The novel phenomena of transforming Palestinian women's embroidered garments into a national symbol 
gave an innovative breadth and depth to a people's cause. Through embroidery, they transformed the identity of a simple domestic peasant dress into a canvas depicting a nation's cause and its struggle for liberation. This in itself is a unique and unprecedented occurrence on the international scene. So here we see the flag and the, uh, uh, the Aqsa Mosque and the uh, uh, outline of the map of Palestine with the colors of the flag. And this is a boy with the uh, sling shot. This is how they were the, uh, showing the resistance to occupation. Teenagers were using sling shots and uh, a boy shooting his slingshot at uh, the occupiers and the colors of the uh, Palestinian flag. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk. I'm sure uh, there are some questions you'd like to ask. We have time for a few questions from the floor. So who would like to? Did you, could you repeat that louder, please? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, ah, the camel. Curry shells? Curry. The shells. Ah, cowry shells. Yes. Yes, yes. These same shells. They used all clothes as well. No, they're, they're purely decorative. Purely decorative. Good luck, maybe, because anything comes out of this sea is supposed to be good luck, isn't it? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, yeah. Can you speak up, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I'm hard of hearing, I'm sorry. <laughs> what's, what's the question? Elaborate a little bit about the creativity around the Sea of Galilee, is that? Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more about Around the, the Sea of Galilee? I don't understand the question. Yeah. You have to speak up, please. Yeah, but can can there, you come here, please? Because we're both there. <laughs> there, is a, there is a microphone there. Just wait. The microphone is coming to you. Yeah. I think in the very beginning you mentioned around the River Jordan there had been some uh, signs of creativity and I had a bit of difficulties in understanding what you meant. Uh, what about around the Sea of Galilee? Had there been any signs of creativity? And 
how did it originate? And if you could please put some emphasis on this creativity. Thank you. Did you get there? No. Around the Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. any, can you elaborate on any signs of creativity? You mentioned the, the River Jordan, but uh, what about uh, the area around the Sea of Galilee? Well, I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't know. I think all over Palestine and Jordan and Syria, uh, it's the same, the embroideries, and the Sea of Galilee <coughs> is the same. I don't know what sort of activities you're, you want to know about, but uh, <coughs> people uh, answered their, their craving for creativity through embroidery. It is a very old art and a very old <coughs> craft that they have inherited. There is nothing in particular different there from the rest of Palestine. <coughs> yes. Question here? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much for your talk. So you explained how, in, back in the day, young girls would learn embroidery and it was in a complicated group where you train themselves and you make themselves into good, successful wives and all the rest of it. But nowadays, in this area, as you talked about Palestine, but in Jordan, young girls learn this so much no. anymore. No. So is there a danger that this art is, is going to be lost? Or oh. are the shop keepers and artisans going to preserve it? And what can we do? There is a big danger of losing this uh, craft and art, I would call it. And then also, um, like the war in Syria. Now, where are the embroiderers? Who's going to teach the young girls? Like, it, I'm not knowledgeable about Iraq, but I'm sure it's the same situation uh, all over. Yani, um, because in Palestine, the war was not as destructive as it is in Syria and Iraq now, or in Yemen. Yemen, they have amazing uh, embroidery, but what will happen after the war stops? Nobody knows. Nobody can predict. So, uh, usually crafts and arts flourish when it is um, uh, peaceful around them. Uh, in Palestine, although it hasn't been that peaceful, but it wasn't as destructive as the Syrian uh, war, as the war, civil war in Syria. Nothing like that. So, uh, and there has been this diaspora, living in the diaspora of Palestinians in, uh, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria itself, that made them uh, continue the art or craft of embroidery. But how long it would last with the machine, with the introduction of the machine, of, with the political situation, with the... Uh, lack of peace, um, who knows what will happen. I'm, I, I don't think, I, can, I cannot predict, but I can doubt that within the coming 10 years, we'll have as much um, uh, of, the embro of the art of embroidery as we've had the last 10 years. I really uh, don't think so. I think uh, the point you raised uh, about uh, lack of peace or internal stability being a major threat to uh, protection of cultural heritage is, is absolutely valid. But there's also the point about uh, imports, free, uh, cheap, cheap imports and... Yes, you that know, started this, before. Yeah, surely that is also, uh, you know, a main threat to... Sure. Uh, this industry because you know it's so much more expensive yeah. in terms of a labor intensive industry like embroidery to continue to rely on that as a way of providing clothing so it's true okay i see a few hands up here uh, let's start from yes you and then i'll come to you please
about men? Men, yeah. Uh, uh, practicing abroad? No. No, not in uh, these three countries. There is only, only in Syria, they, use it, uh, they were men who practiced uh, embroidery in gold thread. And that came later, but also not that much later, but that was the only form of embroidery. The cross stitch, no, men did not uh, practice it. Uh, why is that? Chauvinism, my dear. <laughs> Would you, Dr. Majid, would you sit and embroider a nice piece of uh, uh, pillowcase for your wife? I don't know. I don't know. Commercial and economical difficulties, I might do it. I see. Okay. <laughs> we, ha we have a volunteer. We'll remember that. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Yeah. It's out of Jordan? No, uh, you saw in Beersheba. Beersheba? Yeah. Uh, yes, I didn't go into that. I was asked by my dear friend here first to take uh, embroidery in um, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, including all the Gulf states, and uh, Palestine. Yemen, Palestine. Uh, Palestine, and Yemen. So I said, my God, I'm going to write a whole book <laughs> with this. <laughs> I, I can, and all this to present in 20 to 30 minutes. To, so I didn't go into Beersheba. Beersheba, I would consider it um, following Egypt. If I write about Egyptian, um, I would uh, include Beersheba. Yeah, it's not among the Bedouins because the uh, modern age has not reached them yet. But how, how long can you um, shield them from modernity? And their girls, if they go to university, if they study, if they, they're going to look for other uh, careers than um, embroidery. Knitting? <laughs> we have to see what will happen, but I doubt it will uh, continue for very long. Things are changing drastically in our part of the world, even in Egypt, maybe more than uh, Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. Yes, please, go ahead. Chinese shawl, Chinese shawl. Ah, yes. The influence. I'm interested in the use of the shawl as a transportation as well. Other countries have it, but it's not available in the same way as the Yes, look, that uh, Chinese shawls only in, mostly, I would say, uh, in Bethlehem, hmm? um, because the boys there, they used to go uh, during, under the Ottomans, they used to emigrate to, um, this is one part, one part I spoke about, huh? another part they used to emigrate to uh, South America. In South America, the Manila uh, shawls, the Spanish, and the um, uh, Chinese as well, they were cheaper than buying cashmere shawls, what they used to wear before. Kashmir shores started getting very expensive for them. And then when they went there, those young men used to send their mothers, their fiancés, their sisters, those Chinese and um, uh, Spanish shores. And this is how, for a certain period, they were, but they did not diffuse all over Palestine. And only in Bethlehem, because in Bethlehem they were sort of a small pillbox hat, 
and the Chinese show, uh, before it used to be uh, white, uh, very thin material uh, on top of it. Then the Chinese shows became fashionable. And I mentioned it because this is one important and major uh, influence that has come to us from the East before uh, having all those uh, cultural and uh, commercial ties with China and the Far East. There's a question there with the microphone, ladies. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask is, from seeing a lot of the slides that you referenced where they're actually stored is in the West, is there any program to document these out, let's say in Jordan? All these any types of embroideries and artifacts? In Jordan or anywhere else? There are, yes, there are. There are, uh, there is one lady, Widat Qawar is her name. She has the biggest collection of uh, national dresses or peasant dresses or Bedouin dresses, whatever you want to call them. I think anywhere. She had an ex several exhibitions in the West, including London. But uh, there are many, she is documenting, and there are many books that have come out on Jordanian and Palestinian uh, embroidered uh, dresses. Yes, they are. There's also the book by Sheila Weir on uh, Sheila, of Palestine, course, of course, of uh, course. Yeah, embroidery, especially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you have the book Brava. there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mentioned Sheila because she is associated with the institute. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here, Your Excellency, please. Yeah. I think the question is, I'll just, if I can ask, I know it's quite pertinent to this particular lecture, but is there any influence of embroidery from our part of the world that we have in Jordan? Is it because embroidery in Europe is not considered for the same thing as you know, something of the elite, what they do? Is there any, is there any, do they come together or they totally separate? No, they're mainly separate, but, but because of economic reasons, the French, I know the French designers, Saint Laurent, Guy Laroche, blah, blah, they were doing a lot of uh, their embroidered uh, clothes in India. And this you could tell from the um, uh, colors, and the beads and the um, uh, paillettes that was being used, it was made in India, it's much cheaper. And it's an economic uh, reason, not because they wanted to, they studied Indian embroidery and they wanted to uh, uh, infuse it in their, um, no. It is just because um, economically, Europe has become very expensive and handiwork is very expensive uh, in Europe. But that's the only one, but I cannot tell you that I, I personally don't know of any uh, transfer of our embroidery from the Arab countries to Europe. Please. Well, um, not by governments. My dear, when you have a war going on all around you, you don't think of preserving em embroidery. No, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but when you have two million refugees in a country of seven million, you cannot uh, add uh, to, to, your, to your responsibilities the encouragement. But like in Lebanon, Lebanon, they are the only country that are really successful in creating private societies, welfare societies, the ladies there, uh, who are doing beautiful works and modernized 
embroidered works. This is the only country. I know of the Gulf. I've seen there, but their embroidery is totally, absolutely different from uh, the Levant. And uh, of course, many new elements were introduced to their local Bedouin embroidery. Um, in Iraq, I know the Christian community, it is a small community, and please correct me if I am wrong, in the north, they are working uh, with NGOs uh, on producing typical Iraqi embroidery, but it's, it's, it's minimal. First, because most of the Christian community uh, were uh, left Iraq. Others were massacred. Whoever is left there is, is practicing embroidery to make a living. Yes, please. What advice would you give to second generation expat young people who yeah. sit between different cross sections of our society and the West so as not to lose yeah. the rich tradition? <laughs> Embroidery classes at SOAS? Shall we, should we be thinking? <laughs> I wish I had an answer for that. That is a very difficult question because you're living in England, not in your one of your countries uh, um, back there. And uh, you can, for example, maybe you can be in contact with uh, some people who are producing um, uh, embroidery there and try and have a, uh, to try to, to sell it for them here. Try and uh, have a, a show of, uh, I don't know what you, I'm not, I don't live here. I don't know how easy, how difficult that is. But to try and uh, have, there is the wife of uh, the Jordanian ambassador. She might be able to help you, really. <laughs> and uh, I, otherwise, I don't know how you can uh, help other than trying to market whatever they are doing back at uh, home. That's I don't know how, how receptive the uh, Iraqi ambassador here would be, or the uh, <laughs> Egyptian, or the Syrian, or they all have their uh, burdens, but the Jordanian will help. At <laughs> SOAS, <laughs> uh, we are very conscious of linking up with the Middle Eastern communities, and this is why as part of the centenary year, in fact, we have uh, several cultural days planned to celebrate the culture of some of the countries of our region. And in fact, the next one we have in February 25th is devoted to Palestine. Mm -hmm. So if you know any artists, anybody uh, uh, who uh, can contribute to that day, and if they want to uh, showcase their work or even market and sell it, as part of an ongoing uh, weekend of celebration of Palestinian culture and art. We would be very interested to hear from you. Perhaps one last question? Yes, please.
you can't, I can't at least say, uh, I can maybe now after I've written this, say, <laughs> tell from which village, uh, from which town, let's say, but I cannot tell whether it was from a refugee camp or a, because they use the same patterns. They keep repeating, and if there is any change, I'm not such an expert to, to know if the pattern has changed. Actually, uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Hassanian, who made me prepare this <laughs> paper. Yeah, the, the credit goes to Marianne. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be able to host uh, you back at SOAS and to inaugurate the lecture series accompanying the exhibition. So a big thank you to you. But I'm going to ask uh, Marianne to come and offer a vote of thanks and say a little bit more briefly about the exhibition itself and uh, bring the evening to a close. Would you do? Yeah. Speak. We're deeply grateful that you were able to come and give us this lovely lecture. It was humorous, it was informative, and it gave us an insight into three major countries, Palestine, Syria, and Jordan. Um, what I have tried very hard to do in this exhibition is to preserve our heritage, to actually, the cost, when you see the dresses in the exhibition, they have their villages and their tribal areas embroidered, embroidered as their front, as, as fronts in the, on their garments. When a woman approached a certain person, they could tell that she came from Bethlehem or from Jerusalem or from um, Beit Dejan or any of the other cities. And it was because of the motives and the colors that she used. Everybody used cross stitch, except for a certain part of the country in Bethunia. But you could immediately tell by the colors, by the cut of the dress, by the cut of the sleeves, which area she was coming from. This is historical information. This is geographical information. And sadly, we are losing so much of it. The idea of this exhibition was to see clothes in their context, not what the poor women and embroidered and which what men wove as their dreams. And hence the title Embroidered Tales and Woven Dreams because for us, and preserving them means preserving the geography, the history, the social rituals, the social historical knowledge, which is being lost to us. And so to the young lady who comes from so many different areas, I'd say that if you wrote a paper about this and, or pub and published it, we would have it for future references. And that in itself would be a major, major contribution. Princess. I'd like, from our part of the world, we, when a very erudite human being and a very knowledgeable woman has given us and shared her knowledge with us, we present her with a mantle. It's my great pleasure to present you with a hand woven smoke <laughs> actioner woolen <laughs> I hope many of I hope that many of you will find time to come and visit the exactly. ex exhibition whenever it's possible for you. Thank you. Well, let me end by thanking you uh, very much for your interest and for uh, 
uh, your attention and also posing excellent questions. And please join me finally in showing our appreciation to Princess Vejdan al-Hashmi for her excellent work. <laughs>